Presented by State Farm, helping you get to a better state. Hey everybody, I'm Josh Clark and this is Charles W. Chuck Bryant and we are big fans of technology, especially technology that's everywhere. Yeah, like remote controls perhaps? Yeah, yeah remote controls are absolutely everywhere. There's one right here. I mean, they're just like kind of laying around. Wow. I know. Is that one universal? Probably. But let's talk about remote controls, huh? Yeah, I think one of my favorite people in history, Josh, is uh, Nikola Tesla. He was a great, great inventor. For many, many, many reasons. I could go on and on about the guy. But he basically invented the remote control. And how cool is this? He used it to control a boat. Yeah, in Madison Square Gardens in 1898. Yeah. A, and. RC boat. He yeah. was just like a little kid in an amusement park. But it wasn't just for use in the park. And, and it didn't take off immediately either. Tesla's invention was just kind of kicked to the side. But his original intent for it to be used by the military, yeah. that eventually stuck. Around World War I, the uh, US was doing RC boats right at the German big boats, the non-RC ones. Yeah, they thought, hey, we can put a bomb on these things and right. use it to kill people. And they did. Yeah, uh, another leap forward came in the 1950s when some uh, smart dude said, hey, I don't want to open up my garage door every time I pull in yeah. just to pull in my Studebaker. Right. I want to be able to punch a button and do so. I don't even want to get out of my car. Yeah. I, I want to gain weight while I wait for my garage door to open, you know? Yeah. So yeah, by the early 1950s, remote controls for garage door openers were everywhere. Yeah. But they had one big problem, Chuck. Yeah, they did. What was it? Well, they operated everyone's door. So you would go home and if your neighbors would pick up your signal, mm -hmm. it would open up your neighbor's door. Right, so you'd go to open up your garage door, but then your neighbors would too, and your neighbor would just be standing there <laughs> naked. They learned how to figure out the, uh, the workaround with garage doors with like different codes and signals. Right, eventually. But of course the television was really the no-brainer. Sitting around watching television, who wants to get up and go to the TV and punch it around? Yeah. So they attached a wire. The first remote controls were wired. And believe it or not, buddy, my first VCR had a wired remote control. Yeah, I know the one you're talking about. I saw it in a museum once. <laughs> the problem is, is, if you have a remote control that's wired and plugged in, you've got something that's half a notch better than having to get up and go and change the channel yourself. Yeah. It's obviously technology that can be improved upon. And so engineers at Zenith, who introduced the remote that had a wire, right. said, we can do better than this. Let's try light pulses. Yeah, just regular light pulses though, which was a problem because you know, a burst of sunshine at high noon coming through the window could actually change your channel or turn it to, you know, something you maybe shouldn't be watching. Like Perry Mason. Exactly. Uh, so they moved on. They said, okay, light pulses. It's maybe a good idea, but let's put it off to the side a little bit and let's try sound instead. Not just any sound, ultra high frequency sound. Yeah, which was great because it didn't disturb people because it was out of our uh, range that what we could hear. Right but the dogs of the neighborhood were going crazy with his high-pitched sounds. Yeah, so they kept moving along. I think those stuck around for a little bit because yeah. not everybody cares about how dogs feel. Then finally, in the early 80s, they hit upon it. The big daddy of remote controls, the king, the infrared remote that's still in use today. Yeah, and I remember when those came out and I remember my science teacher in elementary school remarking how you don't even have to necessarily point it at the television. No, you could. That, he could do that, he would bounce that. it off a mirror, and we were all just enthralled as, you know, 12-year-olds in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And that was a pretty cool thing, and that's still what they use today. It is still in use today. As a matter of fact, those apps that turn your smartphone into a remote, they actually usually use a hub that converts the signal from your phone into infrared and then sends it out to all of your stuff. So, even in this advanced, wacky, technological age that we find ourselves in, the infrared remote is still in use. Yeah. But there's two big challengers to the throne and they look like pretty heavy contenders. Yeah, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth are on the scene now and giving infrared a run for its money. And um, pretty much we're gonna come to the day where your smartphone with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth will be able to operate pretty much anything in your house just like a remote control. Yeah, sans hub that converts things into infrared. And the great advantage that Wi-Fi and Bluetooth have, which by the way use radio frequencies, so they're bringing it all the way back to the beginning where Tesla started, yep. um, is that they have the advantage of ubiquity, right? Anything that can uh, give out information or take in information via Wi-Fi or Bluetooth 
can all conceivably be hooked together to one remote. And that's where we find ourselves now today. Yeah. You know what they call that, buddy? What? It's progress. <laughs> it is progress. So watch. I'm going to turn off this camera right now. Oh, that's nice. You're Thanks. Right. But wait. Uh, thank you for uh, watching this. Hooray, technology. Especially technology with an interesting past.